Welcome back to the Virtual Antics Podcast. I am so excited because today we are talking with someone that has had similar experiences to my own, as well as a lot of you that are listening out there. So I'm really excited to, you know, int- introduce you and her story to you guys. So welcome, Heather. How are you today? Hey, Natalie. I am doing great. I'm so excited to be here. This is amazing. I'm so excited you're here. This <laughs> is so much fun. So could you start a little bit with your story, especially I know you were a stay-at-home mom? Yeah. So my husband and I got met in college, got married right out of college. And quite frankly, he got the better job, the higher paying job to start. So I was like, okay, that's where we're going to go. And so he actually got promoted six times in five years. Yeah. So we like lived someplace for six months, nine months, 13 months, you know, it was like one of those kinds of deals. And so we decided because A, I was unemployable, that we would just go ahead and start our family. And so that was my, that was my job. That was my deal is that I, you know, was the stay at home mom and all three of our kids were born in three different states. And we bought, I think we bought five houses before we were 30 years old. So, I mean, it was just like a whirlwind of craziness. And then, you know, his, he was in sales. So obviously he he traveled quite a lot. So we got, so we had a routine where, you know, a routine when daddy was home and when daddy wasn't home. And, you know, meanwhile, I volunteered at church and I ran the Bible school and I co-wrote and co-edited a cookbook. And, you know, I did all the things that you do as a stay-at-home parent, you know, made sure the house ran, kept us in budget, all of those things. So, and then 2007, we were in St. Louis, Missouri at the time. And the fellow who was the president who had hired him got let go by the board. So, new president came in and wanted his own team. Understandable happens all the time in corporate, but we realized that we didn't want to continue in corporate. And I say we, because it was very much while he, he was the job person, you know, I made his life, our life run. And so we looked at it as, you know, it was our career. And I, we just said, you know, let's, let's look at something else. So we put our house in the market in St. Louis and we moved back to North Carolina, where I'm from. And we had no idea what we we're going to do. Three kids in private school and a house that hadn't sold. And this is just when the t- you know housing markets are starting to tank. So we ended up co-founding together a home decor and furniture agency that helps those suppliers sell to the major e-com channels. So think Wayfair, Overstock, Target, Home Depot, Lowe's, Amazon, all of those. And so that began my entrepreneurial journey. Wow. That is a lot. So we move every two years because of my husband's promotions. So I can feel you. I can't even imagine six months in different states. We're lucky we stay in one state and we're actually moving yeah. this month for another one. So I definitely feel you. For those that don't know, there's so much that goes into it between, you know, keeping track of doctors and health appointments, especially if you have children that have any type of health issues, you have to keep track of all of yep. that because the doctors don't. So, and then I, and so much more that goes into it. So I can definitely um, relate to you there. I've already, oh, yeah. so how did you manage that? How did you manage, you know, trying to, you know, be a good mom and organize all this stuff and the business and then supporting your husband as well? Cause that must've been a huge change for him too. And a letdown, you know? Yeah. Um, funny. I don't think it was a letdown. I think it was freeing oh. actually very freeing. And that's kind of common, like from people who had been in corporate and then were either downsized or, you know, whatever the reason was, they were not no longer in corporate. There is a freeing that comes with it because you're not tied to the, you know, I don't want to say tied to the man, but you know what I mean? Yeah. So for him, it was actually really kind of freeing. I am by nature, very organized. I'm very much, I didn't know, and I didn't have the terminology back then to say it, but I'm very systems and processes oriented, right? So, and like, it sounds like, like you, I have, so we have three three children. They're now in their twenties, but our son has an auditory processing disorder as well as ADHD. My daughter, my youngest daughter has ADHD as well as dyslexia. And then my husband has ADHD. So let me tell you. So for us, the best thing to do and the thing that kept the consistency, because I mentioned we had a routine when daddy was home and when daddy wasn't. So routines were the godsend in my lifeblood. And then I'm just really, really organized. And then I was also, you know, know, I was very involved in my community. And so I think that was another thing that really helped kind of level the playing field. And eventually I got to know a lot of other entrepreneurs and that's when we could, you know, like somebody understood 
that side of it, because if you aren't an entrepreneur, it sure is hard to understand what another entrepreneur does. Yeah, definitely. And it's, it's so, I was actually on a podcast yesterday and we we're talking about how like your network is your net worth, but it's also your tribe. And I, yeah. I don't think I could get through my day-to-day -day life without the support system we have. And yeah. it's also not one that was given to us. A lot of people I hear, especially entrepreneurs are like, man, like my family doesn't understand, or I, I don't come from a supportive family oh, yeah. and I'm a former foster kid. So I'm like, well, I pick and chose my tribe and that's what you can do. And yeah. that's the beauty of it is you get to choose mm -hmm. in your corner and who's not. And I think the other important about that too, is to understand that it's okay to have ages and stages, mm -hmm. right? So somebody who may have been part of your tribe five years ago, you know, it's okay if you outgrow them. Like it's totally okay. And it's, it's not a bad thing. It's not a good thing. It's just life. Right. Man, that's, that's such a good point. Yeah. Because, you know, we all go through those stages in life, you know, from no kids to kids to now you have, you know, these little pre-teenagers, it's like, you mm -hmm. really have to adjust and go with it and surrounding mm -hmm. yourself with people that understand that. And I think the same goes with business, you know, like when oh. you're a startup and then now you're six figures. And then you're seven figures and, you know, now you're looking into, I know right now I'm looking into all different things with my business that I never even touched when I first started out. So just, oh, yeah. yeah. So I think that's a really cool thing that you said that like, you know, it's okay to let the people that aren't, you know, growing with you go, you know, mm -hmm. and then setting those boundaries too. Now, do you have any, so I, I like to always think that systems and processes with it comes boundaries, right? Yeah. So were there like boundaries that you guys had to put in to make sure that you were spending time in the appropriate areas and things like that? Yeah. So I think there's a couple of things that I've learned through the years. Not only have I had our our agency, but I also had my own decorative throw pillow company that I started and then grew really rapidly. We did amazingly well. We were a top five supplier at Wayfair. And then I realized this isn't for me. I don't like it. So I decided to sell the business. And that was a huge, like that whole journey was really so much a lot about myself and this concept of, and the concept of boundaries. So tying it all back together, because I realized for me, the product-based business was a lot more demanding of my time at specific times versus the agency. I was able to be flexible. I could go to all of my kids' games. I could do it. So, so the first thing I did that I think was one of the best things I could have done for myself was in order for me to not feel like I was failing or had mom guilt or anything like that. I hired a personal assistant and she really took off a lot of the load that then allowed me to have the flexibility I wanted again. So my boundary was I, you know, I said, okay, this is what I can and cannot do. This is what I'm willing to pay someone to do. Great. Let's be okay with that. That's what that's good. Let's go with that. You know? And so she would do everything from like the shopping and the cleaning, but she also did like volunteering at the school that I couldn't go to. She made sure she picked up the team meals for their sporting events. And she was the one who handled all that. She handled making sure, you know, like she did the, the things, the administrative side and physical side of things that I couldn't do so that I could then show up to the things that were important to my kids. And I think that was the first thing is that I decided, to, you know, boundaries around how I was spending my time and my energy and getting the investment back on that. And that's so true. And that's awesome that you did that. I've been saying I'm going to hire a house cleaner for ages and I still haven't done it. <laughs> you need to, that is like a non-negotiable. I have, you know, I talk about, and then when I work with my clients, I talk about how we have certain non-negotiables. That's one. You should not be cleaning toilets anymore. No, no. Kids are earning money. So they're, they have some chores that they're doing. So it's helping, but yeah, I'm a house cleaner. Yeah. Every other week is plenty yeah. and it, your sanity is going to be worth so much more. Oh, so true. Yeah. I feel like, especially as women, we're always pulled in like a million different directions. So saying it's okay to get that help and, you know, actually putting that step in place where after this call, I'm going to put it on my calendar that I'm going to start looking for <laughs> those house cleaners. Cause I've been saying it probably for years and it just came up in my head again. But I think it's really important that we, you know, take that initiative and realize where we're needing help. Did you ever have to like just sit down and kind of like brainstorm where you're needing help in? Yeah, so as I've grown my businesses, I've now grown three different, you know, seven figure plus businesses. And there have been different things that I've needed at different stages. And so one of the things that I do on a regular basis, so I don't believe, let me back up. I think in part because I have so many people in my family who have ADHD. I don't believe in planning for quarters and entire years. I'll set some big, you know, I'll set some 
basic initiatives and goals, but instead what I, and, and things that I want to work to, but instead I work, we work on six week cycles and we do this planned in business. So for example, what I mean is we will, instead of taking a quarter, we'll take six weeks and then we'll take like a week or two off in between, but, and we'll pick three to five things that are going to move the business forward or and do and it's something that we want in our house. So whether that's like, hey, I know I want to go to Italy this year. It's great. So what do I need to do personally to make sure that that happens, right? So it's things like that. And we break them down into very simple, actionable chunks. And so so basically every, since we take a break in between, so every six weeks, then we have a two week, what we call cool down. I didn't invent this. This is done by the guys who created Basecamp. So what um, I do is then basically every six to eight weeks, I am reevaluating waiting what I need both personally and professionally to best support the goals that I want to have. So it's a constant. And I love that you break it up in the six weeks because I have ADHD myself and I feel like whenever I do quarterly goals, I'm like, I'm not going to like remember and be able to focus on like such a long period of time. That's three whole months, right? Yeah. 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 That's so smart. And then you take a few weeks, you said in between. Two weeks in between two. And we call it, it's called a cool down period. So not only do we have our six weeks, but it might office. I have, I'm at my house right now. My office, we have a big whiteboard and it's like a hill curve, right? And so every Monday, whether it's just by myself or as a team, we have our six week check-in and it's like, okay, here are my three to five things that I wanted to accomplish this week. Where am I in that? And I literally track the progress because I am very visual. And if I don't do that, then it's so easy for me to lose sight of what I want to do. So I have a weekly check-in with myself and the team and my husband, you know, all of that. And um, then in the two week cool down, the first, either the first or second week, usually there's like some time that I take off, you know, but then it's also time to like step back and kind of give your brain a chance to kind of okay think and like, okay, so I wanted to, I want to speak to, uh, you know, a thousand women this year. Okay. This is how I'm going about it. Where and how can I, you know, do it? And like, speak to a thousand women on stages and I wanted to reach, you know, a million on podcasts. So, you know, like, what are the things that I'm doing to do that? Is that still working for me? Is that still in alignment for me? You know, I, so I, I do that. I'm going to run a half marathon with a friend this year. I'm like, following a training plan. You know what I'm saying? So it's very much, it sounds so crazy, but it's the same thing that I've done all along. I'm just using different words now to make it sound more systematic. That's awesome. And you know, that's something that I've been really thinking about is a lot of entrepreneurs are just starting out. They don't realize you have to track track your progress because you need to know, you know, where you are. You need to know what's not working, what is, how you can reevaluate. Like, especially once you build a team, that's what you should be focusing on almost like I think 80% of your time. It should be tracking and improving the processes you already have in place Mm -hmm. before you create the new ones. Because I think we also get stuck on creating, creating, creating instead of perfect, not perfecting. I hate the word perfect, but improving our systems and processes. Right. And yeah, yeah, I think that's really interesting that how you, how you track it visually on the whiteboard. That's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, I'm very visual. So yeah. And I actually just, I started my, my first vision board this year. I'm actually another podcast guest said, Natalie, you need to do your, your vision board. How are you visually, you know, because I'm starting it into manifesting and things like that as well. Mm -hmm. And like really trying to be goal focused. And she's like, well, what better way than a vision board? I was like, you're, you're right. You know, we need that. And, but I actually also love, I'm very, I have like an analytics background. So Mm -hmm. the fact that you do a growth chart is like so cool to me, the hill chart, because Mm -hmm. you can really, you know, see that. And there's so many different ways that you can create that and, you know, really track your progress. So that's awesome. Is there any other systems that you really help you? So there's a couple other things that I, I would do. And this is if you have a team in particular or if you just have one other team member. So you just get a, it sounds sound terrible, but you get a spreadsheet and you make a, like whatever the job is, executive assistant, social media marketing, whatever it is, you write down, you make a list under one column, all of the things, tasks, skills, blah, 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 that that position has, right? And then you look at it, like you go to the next column and you ask that team member to rank themselves, one, two, or three. One is they're a hundred percent proficient, two, they're okay, and three, they suck. And so then you go in and you in the next column, you rank them one, two, or three, right? And then in the last column, it's what do I need? 
from this person, not where they currently, where I currently think they are or where they currently think they are. What do I actually need out of this? And what's going to make it so that it frees up my time, we increase revenue and, pro and productivity and, you know, have the traduction for, for growth. And so if you look at that, and you go, okay, what I need isn't always matching up to where the person really is. Am I willing to live with that temporarily? Meaning I don't have the budget to hire someone with a higher skill set. Okay, if that's the case, what's my plan to put that in place? Or am I not willing and I need to go ahead and replace the person? Because that's the, other, the second big biggest mistake I see entrepreneurs make though too, this is one of them, is they hire somebody on their team and they feel guilty letting them go. Your team is, a, your, your business, I mean, is a separate living and breathing entity. And until you treat it like that, you're never going to grow and you're going to get stuck because you're stuck in this limiting mindset of serving your team instead of your team serving the business, right? Yeah. So that's one thing. So it's a way to, and, and you can do this for yourself too. Like, hey, everything is the is the founder or CEO. These are all the things I have to do. This is where I honestly think I am. This is what I need for myself. Well, hell's bells. I have this gap. How am I going to fix it? It's the same. It's just, you know, easy peasy. And then the second thing is, and this is kind of controversial, but I hate vision boards because visions don't mean action. And so instead I teach, let's have action boards, you know, because you can have something on your vision board for years, but what actions have you actually taken to make that become a reality? And so, yeah, so I am, I am anti vision board. I am all about actions. So, you know, whether that's using words or pictures, but you better back it up and say how you're going to get it just because, you know, if you've put out there, I want to live in Fiji. Wonderful. What are you going to do to go live in Fiji? You know? Yep. So true. I think because I'm so analytical that my vision board are very attainable things. So it's like eat more greens because I want to be more healthy. Right. So I have a bunch of like vegetables on my vision board. But I love that, you know, really thinking of it as an action board and, and putting down those steps that you're going to take. I actually created a little note in my phone this week and it said five things I'm going to do every single day to be a badass mom boss is what I wrote. Go. So I called it. I hype myself up. Every time I get a new lead, it says, Natalie, you're such a badass boss. You, you got a new lead in your business. Yeah. You got yourself up, you know? So yeah. I did that and it was like, it was simple things. It was like getting dressed every day, like full up dress and putting your makeup on, exercising and mm -hmm. like taking one hour a day to really focus on the growth of my business. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember the fifth one, but yeah, those were things I was going to do every single day just to, mm -hmm. you know, really help me in all areas of life. Cause they're yeah. not necessarily like these big, hard goals. These are actionable <clears throat> steps I can take every day for improvement, right? To yeah. And feel better about myself, improve confidence and so on. Yeah. It's all habit building, right? Right. I mean, it's because pretty soon, you know, if you continue doing those five things for a year, they're becoming part of your unconscious, right? And you're just going to do them automatically without thinking about it. And then you'd be like, oh, well, I, I need, you know, maybe I need to add X, Y, Z to it. So it's, it's, it's taking the small steps to build the better, bigger habits that become the unconscious action. That is amazing. You gave us so much knowledge and systems that we can put into our business and our lives today. So I really appreciate you for coming on the That's show. So How can we find you? Yeah. So two ways. The first is extraordinarywomen.co. That is my website and tells you all about me and where you can find me. The second thing is I have a podcast called Boundaries, Business, and Boobs. So you can go there at boundariesbusinessandboobs.com. And if you are struggling on how to talk about boundaries with people, either in your personal life or work life, I have a free little guide there under the nine ways tab. You can click on that and you can download the nine ways to have a conversation about boundaries. That is awesome. I love that. And I love your podcast. Yeah. Thank you so much for uh, coming on Virtual Antics Podcast. Absolutely. See you guys next time.